All right, uh, hey, before I turn it over to the moderator, I'd ask uh, if anybody's uh, sitting in the back fighting for a seat. There's lots of seats up here toward the front, and I don't think there's a chaplain on the front row with a, an offering plate, so you're, you're probably going to be safe <laughs> sitting down front. Um, but uh, we, uh, we're, we're kind of visually impaired up there. It, it sort of feels like we're about to go under an interrogation with those spotlights coming at us, so we, we may have difficulty seeing some of the folks in the rear. So the farther you sit forward, the easier for us. Uh, not that you should worry about us, but uh, we appreciate it. And Steve, to you. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to today's Institute of Land Warfare panel discussion on regionally aligned forces. My name is Colonel Steve Smith, and I will serve as your moderator for this morning's event. Before introducing our panel, I'd like to provide some administrative remarks. First, from our uh, public affairs office, and it's written in itty-bitty print, so please excuse me. Army Public Affairs is seeking audience feedback on this panel slash forum. If you receive a feedback, if you received a feedback forum when you came in, or if there is one on your seat, please take a few minutes to complete it. The forum will provide valuable feedback that will help the Army gauge communication of key messages and will assist our Army in planning future Army panels and forums for AUSA events. At the end of the panel, Please turn the forum in either by placing it in the designated box near the exit of the room or hand it off to one of the public affairs representatives. Army public affairs representatives, please identify, identify yourself by raising your hands. Okay, there they are in the back of the room. Ladies and gentlemen, located at your seats is a short trifold on the Army's regionally aligned forces concept. It is provided as a takeaway and one which ought to serve as a good primer for today's event. Following my introductions, General Allen will present a short regionally aligned forces overview to set the stage for follow-on questions and answer. Immediately following his remarks, we'll open the floor up to your questions. In the aisles are four standing microphones. Once the floor is opened, I'd ask you to please move forward with your questions, and we'll alternate between the microphones in order to get to all of you. If you do have a question but are unable to move to a microphone, please raise your hand and one of General Allen's crack team will move to your, to your seat and or pass the microphone to your seat so you can ask right from that location. We'll also be fielding questions from a virtual audience uh, facilitated by our public affairs officer. Now for introductions of our, of our panel members. Next slide, please. Our panel members represent a significant breadth and depth of operational and institutional experience across both the United States Army and the French Army. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce today's starting lineup. <laughs> Leading this morning's panel, General Dan Allen, Commanding General of the United States Army Forces Command. General Allen's operational experience includes almost every major U.S. combat operation from Grenada through Operation Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom as well as experience during the U.S. humanitarian assistance and disaster relief response to the earthquake in Haiti, and most recently as Commanding General of 1st Cavalry Division and CJTF-1 in Regional Command East Afghanistan. Lieutenant General Huggins, the Army Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations and Plans, G357s. Similarly, Lieutenant General Huggins has multiple combat tours at every level, most recently serving as the Commanding General of the 82nd Airborne Division and CJTF-82 in Regional Command South, Afghanistan. Providing insights from the perspective of the United States Army Reserve is Lieutenant General Jeff Talley, the Chief of U.S. Army Reserve and the Commanding General U.S. Army Reserve Command. Lieutenant General Talley's operational experience includes command of the 926 Engineer Brigade, Multinational Division Baghdad in support of o Operation Iraqi Freedom. We are also most fortunate today to have Major General Promotable Olivier Tremont, Commander of the French Army's Forces Employment Doctrine Center, the equivalent to the U.S. Army's Combined Arms Center at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. An Airborne Marine Infantryman, Major General Promotable Tremont's operational experience includes service in the Balkans, the Middle East, Africa, and the Pacific. Providing an Army Service Component Commander's perspective and recent experience, is Major General Pat Donahue, the Commanding General of the U.S. Army Africa and the Southern European Task Force. Among other deployments, Major General Donahue previously served as the Deputy Commanding General, 3rd Infantry Division, during Operation Iraqi Freedom's transition to Operation New Dawn. 
Major General Patrick Murphy, the Adjutant General of the New York National Guard, to provide the Army National Guard perspective and bringing substantial personal joint and interagency experience. Most recently, Major General Murphy led the New York National Guard's response during the Superstorm Sandy relief efforts in October of last year. Bringing the Special Operations Forces perspective is the Commanding General of the United States Army Special Forces Command, Major General Chris Haas. Major General Haas has extensive experience in both Operations Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom, including command of the Combined Joint Special Operations Task Force Afghanistan, 3rd Special Forces Group, and subsequently command of the Combined Forces Special Operations Component Command Afghanistan. Finally, making the trip down from Carlisle, Mr. Nathan Fryer, a 20-year Army veteran and associate professor of National Security Studies with the Strategic Studies Institute, who has contributed to multiple strategic planning efforts, including the 2005 National Defense Strategy and the 2001 Quadrennial Defense Review. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce today's panel lead, ladies and gentlemen, General Dan Allen. Hey, good morning, and it's great to have uh, all of you here with us, and uh, I'm sure that uh, this is going to be a, a rich opportunity for us to have a dialogue about regional aligned forces and their impact on national security and our Army's efforts to ensure that uh, we work this in concert with our unified action partners. Let me also thank our distinguished panel members for participating in today's panel. Uh, I'm confident uh, they are more than ready to answer the hard questions in particular. Each brings a unique perspective on regionally aligned forces and I believe will help provide uh, greater depth and context to our regionally aligned force employment uh, and I'm sure we'll be able to address the majority of your questions on this topic. Before we begin, let me take just a few minutes to lay the foundation uh, for our dialogue uh, with just a couple of slides. Uh, at your seats, as was mentioned, you do have a regional aligned force trifold, um, and I'm not going to insult your intelligence. I know you know how to read, uh, but I also know the print on that is very small because I had to read it uh, previously. So I'll try to hit some of the high points up front. So let's get started. If we go to the next chart, to begin, let's first define what we mean by uh, regional aligned forces. And quite simply, regional aligned forces is the Army's vision to ensure we provide combatant commanders with tailored, responsive, and consistently available forces in support of their needs. Habitually aligning our forces to the combatant commanders creates clear advantages for the combatant commanders as well as for our soldiers in our units, some of which are highlighted on the slide. Regional Line Force is not limited to the active component. It is a comprehensive approach that includes our active, our guard, and our Army Reserve, or what we refer to as the Army Total Force. It is uh, also not limited to our brigade combat teams, though that tends to be a focus area as we discuss our approach to the regional aligned forces. It includes the full array of Army capabilities, and they are tailored to meet the specific requirements that the combatant commanders identify and it is facilitated by our Army Service Component Commanders. And uh, Pat Donahue will be able to talk to you in, in great detail about some of the fidelity and the agility of the efforts that we've uh, demonstrated this past year with the 2-1 Armor Brigade Combat Team. Through the, this alignment, our Army soldiers will be better prepared and postured to support combatant commander requirements, whether they be theater security cooperation, emergent operational requirements, or a set of missions across the full range of military operations. We can and will have forces prepared to meet whatever those requirements are. Next chart. Now given our Army's uh, current operational tempo, particularly with ongoing operations in Afghanistan, uh, we will not fully implement regionally aligned forces in accordance with the Chief's vision until more forces become available. Nonetheless, looking forward, just as the end of operations in Iraq provided the opportunity to initiate our regionally aligned force concept, the ongoing drawdown of forces in Afghanistan and the ultimate transition of full security to the Afghan government and Afghan security forces will increase the availability of Army forces for the regionally aligned force employment. Aligning our 
Continental United States base formations with each of the nation's six geographic combatant commands best enables us to respond to varying degrees of both formal need and emerging requirements as we go forward in this uncertain environment. This in turn contributes to a predictable, efficient way of preparing our forces, preparing our soldiers, and preparing our units to meet the needs of combatant commanders. And as we tailor our Army to meet new fiscal realities, we are mindful of the complex global threats that are out there, and we will seize the opportunity to adjust our existing approaches, both in how we prepare our forces and how those forces are employed in support of the combatant commander's needs, leveraging all of our capacity across the total Army and all of our training locations. Regional Line Force specific training will provide critical experience and expertise amongst our leaders and soldiers and our formations to complement the work of our regional experts from our special operations forces and our foreign area officer experts. Next slide. Now, why is it important to the nation? I think for most of us it's relatively intuitive but let me just hit a couple of the high points. Because our business, the Army business, occurs between and among people, what has been referred to as the human domain. And the words that define our prevent, shape, win strategy reflect deliberate actions. Preventing and shaping conflict requires engagement, routine, deliberate interaction between us, our allies, those on the fence, and yes, even potential adversaries. Leveraging our many partners in our sister services, the interagency, the multinational community, and the many non-governmental agencies operating every day around the globe is a critical and integral component of our regionally of regional aligned force approach. Our regional alignment activities will complement, not compete nor supplant, the unique capabilities that each of our partners brings to this effort and to stability in the regions. Doing so will optimize available resources and capacity, enabling what we believe will be better outcomes for the nation. And if necessary, regional familiarity among our soldiers and our units better postures them to fight and win decisively wherever and whenever the, the nation may direct. Next chart. So where we are, we're moving forward and have been globally and regionally aligning available Army Corps, Army Divisions, selected brigade combat teams, and enabler capabilities from across each of our components in support of each of the geographic combatant commanders. Our soldiers, our leaders, and our formations are routinely participating and tra in training and exercises and theater security cooperation activities around the globe. A couple of recent highlights. In Pacific Command, First Corps recently completed participation this summer in Talisman Sabre 2013, a biennial training exercise focused on combined United States and Australian operations. This exercise resulted in First Corps certification as a combined force land component command to support U.S. Pacific Commander, which covers nearly half the globe and includes 36 nations. In AFRICOM, as General Pat Donahue will be prepared to talk about in some detail, 2nd Armored Brigade Combat Team of 1st Infantry Division recently completed participation in Exercise Shared Accord 2013 another biennial training exercise to strengthen relationships and cohesion between the United States and South African militaries. This exercise also brought to bear the 82nd Airborne Division's 2nd Brigade Combat Team, elements of the 10th Special Forces Group, elements of the Washington, D.C. and New York National Guard units, and soldiers from the 3rd Infantry Division. A tremendous illustration of the Army total force supporting the needs of our geographic combatant commanders. 
And next slide. And I promise this is the last one unless we don't get the questions we need, in which case I'm, I'm told that uh, Steve Smith has 200 more data-filled slides <laughs> ready for you. <laughs> Regional Line Force is our Army's vision to enable the Army total force to remain globally responsive and regionally engaged. I'll turn it over now to Colonel Steve Smith to facilitate what I'm sure will be a lively discussion and dialogue. And as a special incentive again, Steve has 200 slides you don't want to see ready in case your questions lag. And uh, just so you know, we have the Army Desk Ops on the table for a reason. He's accustomed to answering the unanswerable hard questions. <laughs> so if you have a really hard question, Jim is ready for it. And with that, Steve, to you. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, the floor is open for your questions. I would ask you to move forward to the microphones, and as you do, uh, we'll call on each of you so that uh, the panel can answer the questions that you have. So please come forward and ask away. It's always that pregnant pause for the first question. Everybody's afraid to ask it. Sir, please. Gentlemen, good morning. My name is Mike Hoffbar. I'm a contractor with Booz Allen Hamilton. What do you see or the, may be any in policy impediments to regionally aligned forces concept? For example, uh, the units that are deploying to Afghanistan right now train on a lot of non-standard equipment and get urgent material releases in order to be able to conduct that training. But those urgent material releases don't apply to units that aren't going to Afghanistan and regionally aligned forces and global response forces need the ability to train on a non-standard equipment that they're being equipped with to better deploy to those areas. So there are other types of policies that you see need to be adjusted and adapted to fit the regionally aligned forces concept and make it work as you envision. Uh, well, I know that uh, General Donahue can probably give you some concrete examples. I, I will t speak in general terms that our Army Service Component Commands uh, play a vital role in helping identify specific training and equipping needs for their regions. And then we work with the headquarters of Department of the Army to ensure that we can provide both the training and equipment that that force that's going forward will need to operate effectively in the environments that they will go forward in. And uh, thus far, we have not identified a challenge uh, in our agility or ability to enable a properly trained and equipped force to meet the Army Service Component Command's needs. Pat, anything you wanted to reinforce? Oh, sir, yes. Uh, interestingly <clears throat> enough, a lot of the uh, initial challenges we had were, were not with American weapons, but were with foreign weapons. And so uh, I know that 1ID and 2-1 uh, ABCT with the 162nd Brigade and Direct Assistance and 10th Group uh, develop a, a university called the Dagger University to ensure that every soldier leaving Fort Riley left with the proper skill sets that, that would enable them to provide the requested training. And often that required them to have some knowledge on a foreign weapon, which was so it's not what you're talking about, but it's something completely different. And that was, it's a good challenge. It's, it was uh, one that uh, we're still working through in some cases. There's always some new piece of gear that we hadn't seen before that we have to get spun up with. And, and we're working uh, through various means to get that done, but it's not has not been an obstacle to uh, uh, heretofore. And uh, one of the blessings we have at uh, Forces Command is we're co-located with the United States Army Special Operations Command and with Special Forces Command that Chris Haas commands. And uh, we've got a great supportive relationship there so that if we need a, a augmentation of our capacity to deliver foreign weapons training, then USASOC and our special operators stand forward uh, and ready to, to fill that gap. And they've done a great job, as you heard, about the 10th Special Forces Group in support of Fort Riley. Okay, sir, back here. Sir, I'm Major Matt Kelly from the program uh, with regard to the regional alignment of forces. Is, there, is that in the works, or is there a, uh, any look into that? That's a, that's a great question, and uh, we've been uh, fortunate this past year uh, to leverage the capabilities of the 162nd Brigade at Fort Polk, Louisiana, uh, where we have uh, assigned within that unit foreign area experts from every region of the world who are able to uh, assist in that effort of culturally preparing our units. Um, and we are in close dialogue uh, right now with the United States Army Special Operations Command and Training and Doctrine Command to solidify the way forward to ensure that we can meet the uh, 
both the cultural preparation and the minimal uh, language skills necessary for soldiers to be effective. We are not going to turn them into special operators. We're not going to turn them into language uh, linguists, uh, but we do have uh, linguist capability resident within our formations that we uh, leverage to assist units before they employ. Um, I know that you deal with dozens of languages on a daily basis, uh, Pat. So you may speak. Thank you, sir. What we found out is, is that you know, within a lot of people view Africa as a country, as a continent, and each country is is completely diverse, maybe 50, 70 languages within that particular country. So it's almost fruitless to, to try to develop a you know a regional line force and become a linguist so they're proficient. But what what has been very effective is that this Dagger University and the, and the programs that Forcecom has set up. We are sending our soldiers there so that they're culturally fluent. They know how to operate, they understand the dynamics within the culture, understand how to interact with, with the, the, the people they're training. And more importantly, they're also taught how to use translators. And so, and, and so we, we've trained them in that. And, and the, language, the two languages that we find most useful in Africa are English and French. So normally speaking, every you go to a place like Chad, they'll speak 50 different languages. Uh, but they, the common language is French. And so uh, there is training being done within 2-1, so there is proficiency in French, basic proficiency, when they show up. So I, I don't think making us FAOs where we have linguistic ex expertise in all the languages we'll be dealing with, you know, Bantu, Swahili, et cetera, is a real fruitful endeavor I, because I think we can get the effect where we, we want to achieve through becoming culturally fluent and through learning how to use interpreters and learning a basic common language like French and English. Matt, that's a, that's a great question. Um, where the Army Reserve is helping in this area is uh, 100 percent, with the exception of one brigade, all conventional civil affairs for the total Army is in the Army Reserve, aligned under one two-star command located at Fort Bragg, USA KPOC, which reports to USARC, who works for Dan Allen and Forcecom. Those civil affairs folks <clears throat> often are trained in, in lang different languages and certainly in, in understanding cultures and how to use interpreters. And we have a very close relationship as they're part of the regional line force through the Army Reserve uh, plan that supports General Odierno, but they're also aligned very closely with Charlie Cleveland and his folks at USASOC. And what we're trying to do is leverage that a lot more because often those are the skill sets that they have from their civilian acquired skills. They may work for the State Department, to be frank, in some cases they may work for other agencies, but they have those skill sets and we're leveraging those and we're seeing that that is a very efficient and inexpensive way for the Army to access some of those capabilities in the Reserve Command. Okay, I've got a question here, sir, for uh, General Tremont. Uh, reference uh, regional alignment of forces it, um, perspective uh, from recent operations in Mali. And the question is, the recent French-led operations in Mali were impressive. How did the French Army's own version of regional alignment contribute to that victory? Sir. Um, thank you. Let me begin with a personal uh, experience about foreign language, the French point of view. Uh, in uh, 86, I was a young captain in the Marines. And I was in Chad for a, an emergency mission. And uh, my mission was to translate uh, some explanation about the American missile red eye, anti aircraft red eye. So there were two American agents, agents, military, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they spoke English. Um, I tried to understand the technical explanations. I translate that in French for some Chadian from the south that speak French. But this other guy had to translate that right. in Arabic Chadian. And the fourth one had to translate that into Tubu dialect, because the Tubu were to use that <laughs> against Gaddafi's flights, <laughs> Gaddafi's aircraft. So this is a difficult issue. Language issue is very important. Yes. yes. Okay. So the French have a good advantage in Western Africa, because most of people speak French. But it's not uh, sufficient. Perhaps we need a more foreign language. Uh, the French vision of the regionally aligned forces is uh, quite different from the American because we are a small-sized army. 
And uh, we had that kind of system before uh, the professionalization. You know, the French army was mixed. There were conscripts and professionals. Uh, and after the first Gulf War, uh, President Chirac decided to professionalize, fully professional army. It was in uh, 86, and we needed four years to transform the, the army. So before, we had some kind of regionally aligned, with, aligned forces. The heavy units with conscripts were uh, facing the east. It was the Cold War and after. Mm -hmm. And some professional units, so you know, the Foreign Legion, the Marines, and the Brave Troopers, special forces were dedicated to special theater operations. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of regionally aligned forces. The price of the professionalism uh, has been very heavy because we have been uh, obliged to divide uh, the, the size of the army by two. So we only have uh, eight uh, uh, combined arms brigade today, and we have much more before. So because of the scale of the size of that army, we cannot specialize the units um, in a recent study, uh, this is a quotation I, I found, an American study, a report, uh, I can read, the French military culture is a way of war well suited for scarcity. Further, the French have a long-range practice with operating with few resources. So that is one explanation. We do what we can with what we have. Um, the, the second explanation is uh, the historic background. You know, we, have a, we had a big empire, and it's one of the reasons of the Francophony. Much of uh, Africa speak French and English, but French. And this heritage uh, has uh, good consequences for, for our army. Uh, first, uh, we, have a, we give, since long, a priority to cultural skills. You mentioned that, the understanding of other cultures and civilization. We have also a high level of uh, autonomous leadership. You call that mission common, but the French practice that, that because we are small units isolated and they must decide by themselves. We have therefore a good spirit of adaptation and flexibility. We are expeditionary minded since we are professional and because I'm the boss of the combined arms center of the doctrine, we have a good doctrine. <laughs> <laughs> the doctrine is adapted. Uh, for the conflicts. For example, the brigade that went to Mali had two books, one brand new book about the war in desert, and one another historic book, historical book about uh, all the Tuaregs uh, uh, drive their raids and attacks in the desert. So understanding. Um, today, and perhaps uh, we'll show some maps, we have a quick contingency deployment system, uh, four families of forces, so the figures you have here are the joint forces, but the army, are, we are 80% of these figures. In yellow, you are the, f the French territories that we call sovereignty French, uh, forces. In France, any citizen who lives in the French met in metropolitan France or overseas territories has the same rights for health, for security. So we have permanent forces. Uh, and it's very good because we have rotating units um, I think that more than 20% of the soldiers in that areas are rotating, that they train to specific areas. I was in the Pacific before, so we train uh, um, nautic skills or mountain. Uh, the second family, and it's very important for the operation, for example, when there was a big crisis in Haiti, the French contribution for the solution of that with the Americans were the people from the West, West Indies, from La Martinique and La Guadeloupe. The units arrive very fast. Mm -hmm. um, the second family is the green one. So we have, because of the history, permanent bases in Africa. So you can see the green uh, in Dakar, in uh, Libreville, Gabon, in Djibouti, and the, in the Emirates. So we have agreements, and we have permanent forces. They can train, and they can react. In red, we have an, a third type of forces deployed, that is the, what we call operations. So there are serious things. We have permanent forces in Chad, uh, in Ivory Coast, in Central Africa, and in Mali since the beginning of uh, this year. And we have a permanent uh, reserve brigade among eight, one permanent for six months. We call the Cheetah system, the Rapid Reaction Brigade. So to sum up, the French system is adapted for our modest size. 
and it um, it enables us to answer the rather high level of ambition of our country, and we can uh, treat the regional crisis with that. So I think that uh, Mali is the next slide is a good example. Um, I would say that uh, this operation, that name is name is Serval. Serval is a small white cat, so it's good for the size of that operation, only three, four thousand, uh, one brigade level. Uh, very good example of contingency <coughs> deployment. Why did we send such a quick and strong response at the very beginning of January against the jihadist threat? And why uh, some journalists called rather unfriendly uh, that unilateral operation? So uh, we had at the beginning very clear political guidance. The first was to protect Bamako because we have 6,000 uh, nationals and the Jesuits <coughs> were on the verge to control Bamako. The second was to surprise the enemy be be before they are in the cities, so in the bush. Third is to create a shock, especially in the other African capitals. They were slow to mobilize their forces and they saw the French, so they came and it accelerated the deployment of those African forces. How we did that? Two main elements. First, uh, first echelon, uh, we used the pre-positioned forces that, that I described. First of all, the special forces uh, from Burkina, number one, uh, from Burkina Faso, and the first French uh, killed in action in that operation was a lieutenant uh, helicopter pilot who was killed during a, an helicopter raid. And uh, in that echelon, we took some, we gathered an on-call uh, battle group from Chad and from Ivory Coast, uh, both light infantry and armored, and they came by road and by uh, plane. And the second echelon was the brigade, the heavy brigade, the Shita brigade, with three battle groups, including one of uh, foreign legion paratroopers, they jump. And their, uh, the first echelon mission was to stop the rebels, and the second was to uh, seize the Niger bent and to destroy the enemy in the mountains. So it was well balanced. I want to give a, a focus about the role of Chad in that mission, and it will interest uh, my neighbor. Uh, Chad, the participation of the Chinese was huge because they sent two to three uh, thousand soldiers by road from, from Chad in, in Red Hill to, to the north of Mali. And they fought very tough uh, fights with the French, and uh, they have a very heavy loss, more than 50 soldiers killed in the operation. And why did they, uh, did they uh, take part of that conflict so intensively? <coughs> because it's kind of blood debt. And in, uh, some years ago, in spring 2008, uh, uh, president was attacked by, from Sudan. There was a big raid from uh, rebels, and the French helped them, and he did not forget, so he gave. So this is kind of French touch. We have links, historical links, <coughs> and uh, the success of that mission in Mali, it's not a unilateral, unilateral mission, because each time we, say, we see the, an objective, African battalions came, yeah. and we, can, we could start again and uh, have the good momentum of action. So that is uh, another point. And to sum up, I can give you my, the main lesson learned of that mission. Uh, the key lessons, decision. Uh, we are the clear political in state. We have a short political loop. The president decided and some, hours, some small hours we jumped. Uh, the risk was assumed at all level from the president to the platoon leader. Everyone knew that it was dangerous, but the risk was assumed. The deployment was uh, successful because we have pre-deployed forces, just like I mentioned. And it was successful also because we have high readiness forces, the Cheetah Brigade, so we send it. And we always have a regional approach. We don't need deal with the Mali question, but we, we dealt the same way with the Niger one, the Chinese one, the Mauritania, it's a global approach. For the fight, we had a fully integrated ma maneuver joint and combined arms in the depths. The French uh, chief of staff, General Rachmadou, said the return of the maneuver after 10 years of FOB in Afghanistan, a 
good momentum. It's an alliance of high technology and very old style war combat, both. An alliance of uh, audacity and strong leadership. And last but not the least, the support was decisive, the US support for strategic alert because we have, gaff, uh, we have gaps and intelligence among us somehow. The international support also from EU and the UN. I should mention the French-UK project we have to build an expeditionary force with, with the UK and the French. So we are preparing that and we are, I think in the future we will be able to do the same thing in bilateral. And uh, one of the support key issue is the mobilization of the African, I mentioned that. Thanks to our system of prevention we have in Africa. So, to sum up, crucial acculturation of forces to human and cultural awareness, to physical environment, and uh, updated and well-known doctrine, <laughs> and lesson learned, uh, feeding the doctrine. Thanks for that. We appreciate that uh, really uh, thorough rundown on what was a uh, complex and very effective execution. And, and I know the uh, support for that continues today, so we appreciate all that you're doing. And may, may I suggest to ladies and gentlemen, we have in the French booth um, some six captains and XCO, NCOs coming from Mali, from the foreign region, from the Marines, and from the light infantry. Booths uh, all B stand 24, 25. And you can speak with them because they are the true actors. I'm just the responsible of the resident. <laughs> Great. Thank you. So, right here. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Thanks for your time. And um, there's a lot of knowledge up there. And apparently, according to General Allen, knowledge is spelled in hand. Is that correct, sir? Um, I'm the Senior List Advisor of the National Guard Bureau. My question is directed towards General Murphy. Sir, can you talk about how regional land forces affects the National Guard, and specifically uh, the dual status commander? Okay, so uh, I'm not sure the, I'll have to think about the connection of the dual status commander when we're talking about uh, regional land line forces. You may have given it more thought, but uh, really the, the state partnership program is it, uh, as it supports the combatant commander, and that is really the intent, is, where it's uh, morphed into over the 20 year history of the program. It's, uh, it, is a, it is a mature program and, uh, and some of the country state relationships have changed over that time. But uh, we can focus on a couple different uh, examples real quick. And uh, some of the most mature ones as the, uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union and the, uh, the states that uh, were a result of that were the original uh, states partnerships that were were aligned and those are fairly mature and those relationships uh, uh, still exist today more recently I see uh, Major General Collins in the in the crowd here uh, more recently something like Mississippi being aligned with Uzbekistan in uh, 2012 uh, we continue to to develop uh, new relationships but it really the state partnership program is really a uh, Department of Defense program just administered by the National Guard Bureau. It, uh, it is there to foster that cooperation between uh, a state and nation. And really the, the uh, thing that's the, the greatest benefit to, to these programs are the long-lasting relationships. There's not a lot of rotation uh, amongst the, uh, the military forces that we deal with in some of these countries, as well as in the states. They, uh, the same uh, talent is able to be used for each one of these engagements. <clears throat> Excuse me. In our case, uh, where we're aligned with, uh, with AFRICOM, in, in New York's case, with, uh, with South Africa, we are uh, about, we are 10 years old in the program. Uh, it, uh, it is uh, originally taken on a mill-to-mill -mill, uh, relationship, but it has led to uh, into civilian relationships that have uh, fostered that uh, cooperation uh, between the organizations uh, regularly. And so for, for uh, General Donahoe in, the, uh, in AFRICOM with st eight state partnerships in Africa and, uh, and the regionally aligned force that's, uh, that's put out there now, it is really a tool in the toolbox for the combatant commander uh, linked with uh, either the Army Command 
or uh, in our case, we're able to apply uh, air assets as well. Since we have an, an Air National Guard and an Army National Guard in New York, we have the flexibility to work with more than just the Army forces when we, uh, when we apply that. So as kind of a general overview to, uh, to your question, I think I'll, I'll stop there and, and maybe there'll be uh, more specific questions about those uh, relationships or what it adds to the combatant commander's toolbox. If, if I may add to that, it, you know, one of my uh, talking points is that uh, the RAF is bigger than the 2-1 ABCT. It definitely includes the SPP uh, partners and, and, and the institutional army. And uh, General Ham and I were in Botswana when it really became clear to us. We were at a uh, event, a dinner uh, uh, during an exercise in, in uh, Southern Accord 12. And then when the, the tag from North, uh, North to, uh, Carolina showed up, he's a partner with Botswana. It was like the rock star entered the room. Everybody went to him and started talking, and, and literally General Ham and I were, were ignored in the corner. And he turned to me and goes, I finally get it. This is about relationships. They have a, a personal relationship. The, the, the African generals have been over to the Tag's house in North Carolina. You know, he's been to their house. It's like, like General Murphy was saying. It's, it's a sustained and personal relationship that really gives them access and influence that is beyond what we can provide. Uh, the, other, the other way we, we, we leverage the, the, uh, the state partners in what we do is uh, if we have an exercise that's in an area where the state uh, has a partnership, we go to that state first to see if they want to provide the brigade headquarters that, that we need for the tactical headquarters or whatever. Because they have the expertise and, and the knowledge and familiarity with the people uh, in that particular country and it just makes a lot of sense and it's proven to be very effective. We've done that uh, uh, several times already this year. Okay, in the back here. Hi, my name is Nick Dowling with IDS International. One of the criticisms that I've heard about the regionally aligned forces concept is it is hard enough to dig into the culture of a country like Afghanistan or even down at the provincial level where it really becomes useful. How can you possibly, you know, expose, expect to give forces a useful uh, focus on something as wide as a continent like Africa? And then the other criticism that I've heard is what are you going to do, prepare a unit to you know, be, know more about Africa and then they end up going to the Middle East or the Pacific and, and how is that useful? The answer that I have given out of my own personal experience is that the experience of delving into a culture, learning about the differences between how culture and leadership, tribal societies, non-tribal societies, how those things work, that learning experience, that how to think, is as important as the foundation you provide. But that's my answer. I'd like to hear what you guys think of that. And also, uh, how does the human terrain system uh, program play into regionally aligned forces? Hey, I, I wanted you to know I wasn't kidding. <laughs> First off, uh, Nick, great question. Um, and, and I would not argue with uh, your, your, your kind of first blush response to that. Um, the first and foremost, you know, what RAF is and what RAF is not is also important to, to keep into context. And certainly uh, everybody understands what our force structure looks like today and what it potentially could look like here in the next two to four years. We're, we're not going to be able to regionally focus and create cultural expertise um, in every corner of the world. So we don't intend to. But, but there is a general process to which we hope we can build some institutional knowledge inside each of the organizations to do that thinking, to be able to enter that human domain and being able to understand what is culturally significant, um, where to go get the answers. Um, I, I'd like to elevate it one other piece, and it ties back to the state partnership piece and everything, all the tools that the combatant commanders and the services provide to play into this regionally aligned force strategy or concept. Um, it, it has to be built at the COCOM, so the needs have to be identified fairly early on. We would then turn and align forces to that, um, working with forces command through their mission alignment orders and with the National Guard and the United States Army Reserve headquarters to do so. Um, projecting that demand signal, which I believe the COCOMs through the Army Service component Commands are doing a better job, like with Pat Donahue, um, is key because that allows us to prepare. And I would argue that that is probably the key factor in trying to make a difference. 
Each of the COCOMs is responsible for each of the areas to develop a country team analysis to identify what their goals are so that the combatant commander can achieve his global employment of the force end states, his GEF end states, which then support the unified command plan, which then allows us to figure out how we're going to apportion the force. So identifying those needs and that strategy is key. For instance, we are rolling in the state partnership program, not to try and take credit for what the great works there, but we're rolling that into RAF so that we can start to get that demand signal. And, and, and as we project that in the future, we can do more of the prepare, which is key, in, at least in general ordinary strategy, in the prevent portion of this. Um, it is significant when we have combatant commanders around the world today that say, hey, um, I have to keep my AOR at phase zero. I have to do theater security cooperation. I have to build partnership capacity because I don't, if I go to phase two or three, I have failed my mission. And, and regional airline force is at least one measure by which the Army provides that, that tailorable, as General Allen said, that tailorable scalable force that's forward in many cases. I mean, for them, it's all about presence. It's about gaining access and then flexibility to respond, especially within the parameters of the new normal and those continuous response forces. The United States Army has over 70, approximately 70,000 soldiers forward deployed today, and they're answering a lot of those calls. Unfortunately, our narrative is not that good, and we're not getting the credit for all that work we're doing. And that's what has to roll into this regionally aligned force concept. But uh, the human domain piece of it, we could probably talk for hours, and I think there's a few other forums that'll talk that. Um, you know, we are in some significant discussions with both Forces Command, um, Special Operations Command at USASOC, and uh, TRADOC in terms of how to develop this, and, and some, some large discussions about whether this becomes a seventh warfighting function. But thank you. I, I just want to add to that. Um, I think there's, there is actually a danger right now in the cur current policy and strategy making environment that it looks like it can look like the Army is trying to cover down on the world, right? Um, and, and I think you raise a good point that, that you're not going to be able to actually, you know, the force is going to shrink. You're going to have finite resources available over the next decade. And so there's going to have to be a prioritization that goes on, not only within the Army, but frankly at levels above the Army as well, as to where you want to engage and for what purposes. Um, and so I think, you know, getting back directly to your question, there's two things I think that are really important about this initiative inside the Army. Number one, um, ultimately the operational IQ of the force is going to diminish as, as you know, uh, soldiers begin to separate that were veterans of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, et cetera. And eventually we're going to return back to a force that's sort of focused on contingency response abroad somewhere. Um, and the regional alignment uh, function actually um, gets to actually continuously allowing the force to, to exercise, to, to, to flex its muscles, to challenge itself in an environment that's not, you know, Fort Irwin or the backwoods of Fort Lewis. So I think that, that internally that's really important. What's going to really be important externally for this program, I think, is actually identifying where it's important to engage. Because I would submit actually that, uh, number one, some of the places you want to go and engage and prevent things from happening, you will either A, not be allowed to go into in any strength because you're not welcome, um, or B, the things that would happen in that place are not preventable, right? Um, so <clears throat> as a, a traditional soldier, I think I want to deter you know, an adversary from crossing over a foreign border and threatening one of my allies. Well, that might not be the problem 10, 15 years from now. The problem might be just the sort of the dissolution of the ally itself, right? And no amount of engagement with that ally is going to prevent their political system from collapsing on top of itself. Um, and so I think then comes, therein lies the, the other benefit of regional alignment, which is operating in these theaters so that when you do have to respond to something very non-standard, that you have relationships, you are familiar with the infrastructure of that region, you have operated under austere expeditionary conditions with a partner or with, you know, with partners in that region to sort of respond to crisis. 
So I mean, I think there are a number of things that are going to be very important for this program going forward. I think the real challenge will be in the current decision-making environment, how do you actually allow it to rise to a level of importance that gets it supported above the Army, right? Because this will be eminently important going forward. We will have to respond in critical regions, but the question is, will those regions be actually important to policymakers? Hey, sir, if I could jump in and address and potentially mitigate some of the criticism regarding this aspect of culture or the lack of understanding the culture. So within the Army Special Operations Community, we spend a great deal of time training our operators in the required foreign language and the culture. And yet we haven't mastered that, particularly in a, a continent the size of Africa. So in, in order to mitigate this, what, what really is at the foundation of the RAF engagement and even special operations engagements with partner nations forces is a military culture and the expertise, the professionalism that we begin, we bring and of course that is inherent in that partner nation force. And so since we're not engaging in, in cultural activities in 99% of these cases, we're not working out of embassies. I think this criticism of that the RAF will not understand the culture enough and could be detrimental to it is, is over-exaggerated. I, I have to agree because there's really very little we do that's not done in full partnership with, with the partner army. And everything, it takes a long time. We've got, you know, we're training uh, chatting battalions to go to Mali starting uh, probably in, in early November. Two ones doing that, but you know, I went out there and I met with the Chad and the Mod, and, and I met, went out to the site. All my guys have been working for for months to set this up, so we're doing this thing in full partnership with the, with our partner nation. This is not something we're trying to impose on them. This is something we're doing with them. They, they're more, they're capable. They, they're, they're very well a UN standard. So that's the type of expertise we bring. So it's, I think maybe your constructs, uh, the people who are critical or a little bit different. We're not trying to go in there and impose our will. We're going in there and, and working with partners to, to give them the, the extra uh, capacity they need that they, they, they lack and they, they requested from us, much like what the soft does. Okay, right up front here. Thank you, General Allen. Thank you for your time. <clears throat> My name is Tom Niblock. I'm a senior foreign service officer, um, spent about half my 30 years in and on African issues. I spent four of the recent six in Afghanistan, so I know something about that and have some perspective on a few of these things. And General Tremont, I was on the other end of that chatting operation in 1986, and congratulations on your work there. Very special. Uh, that history hasn't all been told. Um, I currently, however, am serving as foreign policy advisor to General Grass at the Guard Bureau. And with respect to General Grass, uh, I'm not speaking on his behalf or the Guard Bureau, but as a Foreign Service officer. Um, I've been profoundly influenced by my experiences with the State Partnership Program, as have many of you. Um, it really comes down to relationships. And, and General, as you've noted, you know, when you walk into the room and you see the, the, the hero's welcome that the tag gets, and I've done this in a number of countries over the past couple of years that I've been working in the Guard Bureau, uh, it's really quite extraordinary. Yes. Uh, my experience in the Foreign Service is somewhere between year two and year three of building a relationship, there's a material difference. Uh, we've been engaged around the world, and most of our foreign partners say it's Tuesday, it's another American. Uh, in many cases, they hardly remember our name or our face. At some point, though, you know, they realize, hey, you're still here. And then you start talking about families and dogs and pets and hunting trips and whatnot. This is the kind of relationship that the, the adjutants general have developed over 20 years, starting in the Baltics. Um, that's materially different than anything we do in our government, civilian or military elsewhere. And it happens only because the Guard is structurally set up to allow that to happen. You know, I'm a civilian. I can't do that. I stay in a country three, four years. I'm gone. Wish I could go back. Um, I've seen a lot of guard officers who have risen from, you know, lieutenant colonel to general officer rank alongside their foreign partners, much in the same way that the French have done with their critical alliances and partnerships in Africa. 
So, um, you know, that model works. It's cost effective, and I think we all agree on that point. As I think about regionally aligned forces, and I understand the perspective of the Army and, and why this is important and the need for it, but it would seem to me that uh, a large role for the Guard simply makes sense in, the, in that context because you're developing state level, uh, more intensive relationships, but you're also developing some regional perspective and regional expertise. Most importantly of all, you're keeping a lot of the same people on task three, five, seven, 10, 15 years or more. Uh, and as a civilian in the government, I can't do that. And, and frankly, most of the rest of us can't do that. So I would just sort of throw out those comments. And again, thank you for your time. I'm gonna sit down and listen to responses. <laughs> no, I, I, uh, I think uh, you would find everyone on this panel in violent agreement with you. Um, and that is why the state partnership program is a, a critical and integral component of the regional aligned force concept. And it's one that um, we are trying to ensure uh, is also fully aligned with the priorities of the geographic combatant commander through the Army Service Component Commanders or uh, the, the Air Guard's equivalent uh, on the Air Force side. But you're absolutely right. And, uh, and we are um, leveraging those relationships uh, on a re recurring basis around the globe. Can, can I add some? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. From, from the Army Reserve perspective, you know, we provide that stability because we're most of the combat support and service support for the total Army, and in many cases to the total force. So when you think of all those enablers out there, those combatant commanders and ASCCs want to help prevent and shape so they never have to go to a win, a lot of that capability, in fact, to be frank, most of that capability is actually in the Army Reserve. And the Army Reserve has those long-term relationships just like the State Partnership Program in countries around the world. Currently, we're in 30 countries. But we do it through training exercises. We used to do this extensively in terms of overseas deployments for training prior to the last 11 years of war. And so as the Army Reserve supports General Odierno and the Regional Line Forces, we're doing that through a concept called Army Reserve Engagement Cells that are embedded in every ASCC and Army Reserve Engagement Teams that are embedded in every COCOM. And they are linked to those theater enablers that are the subject matter experts in pick your favorite enabler. And that provides long-term stability and relationship building around the world as those were, and, to, and to help define those requirements working as a supporting element to the ASCC and the COCOM. So I just wanna, you know, we, we, we've been doing this for a long time in the Army Reserve. Uh, we got away with it, uh, away, away from it in the last few years because we were a little busy like everybody else supporting the war fight in Afghanistan and Iraq. But we're going back to that under the Army Reserve Engagement Cells and Teams concept that's part of the Army RAF. And I think that, that in conjunction with state partnership, provides that stability and relationship piece that COMPO-1 may not be able to provide at the same level for, for a variety of reasons. Thank you. I, I, I think that, that your question or your comment raised like a really important issue though that I think is still kind of in the balance with respect to regionally aligned forces in the Army. And it, I, do, I do wholeheartedly agree with uh, General Allen and General Talley on this idea that, I mean, the state partnership program is foundational to it, but the real question is, as the active force gets smaller, what is the point? I mean, what is the point? What is the focus of regional alignment for the active forces, right? Um, there is the very, I think, somewhat nebulous idea of we're gonna engage to shape, to you know, create conditions, et cetera, et cetera. That all, that all makes perfect sense. But frankly, I think <clears throat> what makes more sense is that when somebody says, I need a force to do X, dot, 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 that Army regionally aligned forces should be, should be the ones who are racked and stacked to do that. So for example, there may be, one region may have more problems with humanitarian disaster or responsibility to protect problems, genocide, et cetera, et cetera. And so when the president says, I need a force to dot, 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 stand between two warring factions and protect this population, it should be a regionally aligned force that has been at some level has been focused on that challenge, okay, or to secure weapons of mass destruction, or 
to you know, respond to a hurricane, whatever it is, respond to a hurricane, or seize and secure critical infrastructure that has been damaged in a civil war. I mean, there's all kinds of potentialities. And there's too many, actually, to align forces to and to mission them against. However, there, there, there are a finite number that probably should be prioritized and should be um, racked and stacked. And then what you then have is you have regional alignment that not only gets the force, the specific force, culturally sensitive to the region they may be employed in, uh, rotating into that region commonly for engagement and to kind of really sort of do strategic reconnaissance and things like that as well. But also then the mission is tailored so that from, from actual spin up to certification to readiness, they are the ones standing there when the president says, I need the force to do dot, dot, dot. That's my view. If I may build on that, I, I think the, 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 the concept we have for regional line force does get at that, at least for Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, I, one of the misconceptions is a 2 one is like an SVAT brigade. Mm -hmm. Far from that. That's just one of the missions it does. 2-1 is our force of choice for named operations in Africa. Right. There's a, an operation that, that, that uh, you know, we've been doing, like security, uh, providing security in, the, in HOA or the East Africa Response Force. The force we go to is the RAF mm -hmm. because it's a sustained mission, requires expertise on the continent. It, do, it also does the SBAT task, you know, the train and equip missions, mm -hmm. advise and assist missions we're doing in Afghanistan. It is the force we go to for exercises. So we're doing high-end exercises in, in Africa right now with, with, the, with our, the forces we use that include company-level live fires and air, uh, night airfield seizures, mm -hmm. uh, all sorts of high-end training events. So we're getting great training out of it as well as uh, training with our partners. Uh, and, then, uh, and then there's the traditional TSC. So uh, you know, one of the, the, what I'm hearing a little bit is that we're, we're looking at the, the uh, regional line force as kind of like an SBAT from based on our experience in, in Afghanistan. It's not. It is yeah. a force that is able, is trained, it has the knowledge for those particular missions, like mass atrocities, for instance. Mm -hmm. So if they have to, they can be the force we turn right. to. Yeah, I totally agree. Okay, I've got a question uh, from online. Uh, this is from a Mr. Ryan Jones. It's regarding force reductions. The question is, how will the anticipated Army force reductions impact the ability of the Army to implement RAF? All right, the simple uh, answer is a math problem. There'll be less forces available. All right. I mean, that's the short answer. Uh, but the longer answer is that we are going to have uh, all forces that are not aligned to a specific mission, be it in uh, Operation Enduring Freedom uh, to uh, Korea or to other globally assigned missions, will be uh, aligned to a combatant commander based on the needs of that geographic combatant commander as identified through the Army Service Component Commander. So we will have uh, units from all components and all functional capabilities that are prepared, trained, and ready to respond, um, but we'll have less of them. Ma'am, mm -hmm. right here. Good morning. My name is Meg Midget from the Institute for Defense Analyses. And uh, before I came to Ida, I was an Africa analyst. So this has been a great conversation to listen to. Um, but as an Africa analyst, one of the problems that I feel that many organizations face is how to incentivize that kind of expertise um, and how granular you want that to be. And that's an issue we've already sort of touched on, so I won't, I won't harp on that. But um, my two-part question really is, um, is, there a, um, is there a plan to incentivize this outside of the FAO program? And if so, if you're going to make that kind of investment in developing this expertise, will there be a similar investment in institutional knowledge? Because as we know, when you come into a COCOM, you bring your knowledge with you. But unfortunately, that knowledge goes right out the door with you when you leave. So will there be an effort to maintain institutional knowledge, not just explicit, but tacit as well? Do you want a two-part answer or a short answer? <laughs> yes. yes. Whichever you feel like giving. <laughs> the short answer is yes. Um, the uh, longer answer is it is a work in progress. And uh, uh, you all know what's going on inside the United States Army today. We are pretty busy, uh, but we're focused at the institutional level in, uh, in how to codify the means and methods to get at uh, what you talked about. In the near term, um, that is not a, a critical fo focus in terms of the 
uh, trained capacity that we provide to the geographic combatant commanders in the longer term, ensuring we track um, those with the expertise uh, is something that we will uh, uh, bring to bear. Uh, we do track, for instance, language skills. Uh, and when you look at 2-1 Armor Brigade Combat Team, the linguist capacity that they leveraged in the early stages came straight out of Fort Riley, Kansas. And all the great former African citizens that are now United States Army soldiers serving in the ranks who are able to come bring their expertise to bear. But, uh, I mean, as you've clearly identified, uh, we have some longer term uh, issues to, to wrestle with, and I know uh, General Haas and, the, and our sports, special forces teammates have been uh, working this for, you know, for decades, and uh, we are uh, uh, heavily leveraging their experience and expertise. Uh, and one of the relationships that we're strengthening is between our conventional forces and the Special Warfare Center, and some of the experts and expertise that they can provide to the leaders of our conventional force. Yes, sir, I'd add that I think the mere fact of trying to work the alignment um, with BCTs as maybe a, as a building block, the base building block, but we're also aligning divisions and cores. Mm -hmm. I, I think that will also help with the institutional portion of that. Um, you know, it, 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 in my mind, the strategy is always, as I said before, a link back to the country team, is that mm -hmm. has to be developed. But at least from, you know, capabilities as we work with the State Department, um, not to do their job, but to help them with their job, because there used to be some concern about that too with RAF. Um, but the, just the framework at Force Com will establish, well, I think will help capture some of that. I mean, people will come and go. We won't, we won't try and fool you and say we're going to stabilize everybody in that BCT division and core. They're going to rotate. But I do believe institutions also have an ability to hold on to, to knowledge, and that knowledge Absolutely. with repetition I think will only increase. That said, I can't create the expectation also that those divisions and corps um, will always be aligned to the same combatant commander because demand is going to drive that. Um, and, and since we do seem to be fixated on AFRICOM a little bit, I, I would just, you know, add, and because my old boss is the AFRICOM commander, so I have to be careful, but, um, you, you know, numbers are going to be a problem in the future. It, it's just a fact of life. So, you know, we're going to go to priorities in terms of how we're going to address all the needs. I mean, this, this regionally aligned force concept, you know, it is, it is one of the chief's new strategic priorities. It, it is a way to try and get combatant commanders capability, army capability to execute their mission. But, but in some point in time in the near future, as we, as some of us have to go, go through and work with the joint staff and OSD on, on how we're gonna do the allocation and how we're gonna do the assignment and then how we're gonna do apportionment for, you know, con con contingency plans, we're going to run into a numbers issue, as General Allen mentioned. And I'll tell you, it, it will generally fall back to the force allocation decision matrix, the FATM. And Pat can tell you where AFRICOM sits on the FATM. So mm -hmm. it's going to be tough. So it's going to be linked directly to our national security strategy and the defense strategy that, that supports that. And that's how we're working it right now. That's how we're prioritizing. Sir, if I could add one thing to that comment. Command Sergeant Major Stitzel, United States Army Africa. Uh, one of the great things about the RAF is the individual training uh, that those soldiers from 2nd Brigade 1st ID get when they go down to South Africa and participate in shared accord. There's a lot of learning that our soldiers are getting down there on a continent that most people, like uh, General Donahue said early, they think of two countries, Egypt and South Africa. And there's a lot of differences. South Africa, DRC, you get up into uh, Chad where we were recently at. So we can never forget about that importance, that when our soldiers leave from 2-1 and they go to 25th ID, they also take that experience with them. And maybe one day, now, God forbid it does happen, something happened on that continent, and now that young private that was there at Shared Accord is now a platoon sergeant, he has some experience that he can now share with his platoon to get them better prepared. And that is something that is very critical that we forget at the tactical level that the RAF provides. Sir, thank you. That's a great point, Sergeant Major. Thank, thanks for bringing us back to the soldier where it, where it all starts and ends. Okay, right up front. Gentlemen, my name's uh, Major Nick Moline. I'm a fellow with the uh, Chief's Strategic Studies Group. And uh, my question is really tied into the previous comments. It has to do with talent management and RAF. 
as a battalion XO in 3rd Brigade, 1st Armored Division down at Fort Bliss. My S4 was Nigerian. That's where he grew up. He spoke three languages. My S2 was from Ghana. He spoke a number of languages as well. And my, my chaplain uh, was from Brazil and fluent Portuguese speaker. Uh, it really struck me that we have a global army, just even within our formation. I was just wondering what efforts might be afoot to sort of harness that capability that we already have. And then perhaps from a, a futures perspective, has there been any thought given to strategic recruiting uh, to acquire key capability in our regionally aligned areas? You know, having someone from a place is generally better than trying to train a person to know about a place. Well, I'll jump on it first. I go back to something my uh, father-in-law taught me when I was a young captain uh, as a former Special Forces uh, A-team member. He said, your first job when you uh, take charge of your unit is know the capabilities of the people in it because uh, you're going to find out you've got just about every kind of capability you need resident within your formation. So your point is extremely well taken, and I know that that is what Jeff Broadwater did in 2-1. In the first thing he did was scan his formation to identify the resident expertise that he had that he can apply to the problem set um, that he's got. Now, from a, from a wider perspective, I think we have additional work to do institutionally to assist commanders so they're not trying to solve that problem at the local level. We ought to be able to broaden that much like we do with language skill that we do codify. Um, and I think. Uh, uh, we certainly can do a better job at the second point that you make about ensuring we scan for the talent within our formation before we start to train it from the grassroots level. Uh, any other points? So, yes. So first of all, we want to recruit into special operations community half of that formation that uh, you are proud to serve in. And then I would, I would recommend you look at our MAVNI program and other activities that we've done in the special operations community to reach this strategic capability that you were talking about and see the, the pros and cons that, that we've uh, had to deal with over the, the last couple of years since we stood this program up. It, it is a great concept and it works in some cases, but it is, it is also, there are some other significant challenges with it particularly in incentivizing those that you've identified as strategic in nature to help you with this engagement piece. Have you heard that great skill <coughs> program? Uh, I have not, sir. No. Okay. That, that, there is work in that lane. Uh, we, we leverage that uh, for some very, very competitive skills that are in high demand. Um, and uh, there, is, there are programs to manage the great skills that we, we require. Can we expand it? Mm, but as Chris said, there, there, there's a pro and a con to that also. Um, uh, just because uh, you go to a specific region to get a specific capability, uh, you, you better do a 360 mm -hmm. uh, uh, along, that, along that lane. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but there are, are certain programs we will certainly look at, and TRADOC has a lead to expand the talent management uh, aperture to see what else we can do to leverage it. Um, I, I think the more we get into RAF, I think the more good ideas will come, just as you stated, from the, from those that are out there serving in those capable units, and they'll they'll give us some good ideas here at the table to try and work on. Yeah. We're looking at that within the Army Reserve. What we're saying is, okay, folks that are out there that are in Compo One, um, not just the Army, Marine Corps. Pick your favorite service. I hope it's Army, by the way. Um, <laughs> And they have these cultural and language experiences and that they want to go off and serve the nation other ways after leaving active duty. We're re-looking, as I mentioned, not only in our civil affairs program, but the Army Reserve Linguist program to specifically to see if I can, as the car, if I can rebalance that and provide out of my own money some incentives to attract those folks. A lot of those folks leave Compo 1 and, go in, and don't go into Compo 2 or 3. But then they go work for the State Department, or they go work in a number of organizations that uh, the civilian members in this uh, audience represent. Um, you're perfect to be able to continue to serve your nation in uniform as a member of the reserve component, particularly in the Army Reserve Civil Affairs Linguist Community, 
we can provide some incentive there, and we can also provide linkage with special uh, private sector organizations. I'm looking at all that right now, and I'm trying to grow that a little bit as I maybe downsize some of the other capabilities we have in combat support and combat service support. Thanks. I, I, I wanted to just add one thing. I think General Huggins made a really good point that I just want to reinforce, and that is that the the, the way that the current, the way the po policy is headed right now, in, unless it in, involves U.S. PACOM or U.S. CENTCOM, everything else gets squeezed out. And so, basically, innovation right now, any innovation that can pre be protected to anticipate, to have anticipatory capability in other regions of the world or regions of the world that are not necessarily considered top priorities strategically by the Department of Defense right now is going to, I think, is going to be a giant hedge against what will be an inevitable employment of forces precisely where we're not focused. Um, so I think that anything that can be done at the service level, frankly, to protect some of this capability is going to be really important. Sir, back here. So good morning. My name is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Paul Tennant. I'm an exchange officer in the Pentagon in the uh, Department of the Army. Uh, well, God bless you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, it's a privilege to be here. Um, I'd just like to ask what the Army has already uh, put in place and plans to put in place in the future to harness the historical ties and experience of some of your oldest allies and partners in specific regions. And the French example in Central Africa, the British in Eastern and Southern Africa, for example, many of others in other continents. What are your plans on that front to, um, to try and uh, use your relationships uh, with allies and partners to, uh, to make more of this project. James, why don't you answer that question? <laughs> no, no. I was going to ask Colonel Learmont. Uh, but it, 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 it's one that uh, it's not in force comms lane, obviously, um, but it's one the department has to continue to evolve to. And, and one that um, initially I would have thought would have been intuitively obvious, but it, it's, it's not. Um, because I think the conditions have caused us all to kind of withdraw a little bit and focus. Um, you know, there's an assumption out there in today's uh, environment that uh, as we draw down, um, we're just going to depend more upon our allies and they'll step up. Um, the fallacy with that is, is most of our allies are doing the same thing we're doing. Um, so we're, we, we're at an impasse and we'll create a gap. Um, I think this, this is a way ahead and, and, you know, as evidenced by last year's staff talks, um, that we held and the accord we signed together. Those are the things that we've got to continue to do. The, the chief uh, I just made a terrific, out, terrific tr trip out to the Pacific and tried to leverage those. We, we have got to do more of that in the future because we've got to bring everybody's capabilities to the table because um, it, unfortunately there, there are some, as I said before, that are just thinking we can all just go back, focus on our lanes and depend on partner capacity. Um, I don't think that's been brought together in the total numbers we're at. Uh, General Ordierno has asked us to do some more detailed look uh, in terms of literally every partner, potential partner, that's out there in terms of what their armies and what their militaries are doing. And, uh, and as I said, it, I don't make it you know, a lackadaisical comment that says most everyone uh, is doing the same thing, except for maybe some near-peer competitors. Yeah, let me just uh, give you one example where, where this is uh, already underway. Um, you know, Forces Command provides uh, uh, to the Joint Staff the Global Response Force, uh, which is uh, um, the foundation of which is uh, an Airborne Brigade combat team from the 82nd Airborne Division, but which includes um, units from all across the continental United States that bring capabilities for any potential contingency that may be out there. Um, what we have done is uh, invited our allies that have similar contingency response units in their formations. Your country is one of them. Uh, and they have participated with us in recent uh, joint operational access exercises that we've done as we train up our global response force. And uh, it was pretty exciting uh, this past uh, fall uh, we had nearly a dozen nations, uh, only two or three of which participated as participating units, but others had senior leaders present because they knew that they needed to, we needed to learn together about what capabilities we can each bring to bear 
in case the, that response is somewhere in their neighborhood and they might be able to contribute. So I think that's an example of the, the great teamwork that's going on with our allies and partners and that we know is going to get stronger as we go forward. Can I give you an example? Uh, you know, it's always you know, difficult in the Pentagon and it's always easier in the field. And in the field, in, in my case, it's, it's been very pleasant working with French, English, uh, Brits and uh, Dutch, for instance. Uh, we, we use BICES to communicate to pass intelligence to the French in Bamako and in Chad, you know, a NATO system. Who would have ever thought that would be the system we would use? But it's available, proven, and, it's, uh, and we're using it. Uh, we have routine uh, in intelligence updates where we have the, 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 the J2 and, and Serval online with the analysts in, in uh, 66MI in Germany with my analysts sharing intelligence assessments of what's going to happen. The Brits are on there too, as a matter of fact. Uh, so. Uh, we have, uh, uh, I have uh, 10 French officers assisting 2-1 in, 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 with a, a mission that they're going to train. A, we have, at the end of this month, beginning of November, training a battalion in Guinea, uh, getting ready to go to Mali. So I, I think that cooperation, cooperation is happening in the field because our, our interests are so obvious out there. And so I, I think we're probably better off than you may think. Well, from a special operations perspective, the challenge is we rely on the Theater Special Operations Command to to do much of that synchronization with our allies and partner nations. And clearly the funding available that we have to support combined operations with multinational soft partners in, a, in one country is diminishing and becoming less and less. And so I think we have to relook at how, how do we afford, how do we resource more opportunities particularly from a, a special operations perspective to ensure that we're benefiting from this expertise that exists within our British, French, and, uh, and other allied soft nations. And right now, we, we just don't have an answer, and it's, it's going to get tougher for us in the future. I think I'd say thanks. I, we really need to, I, I need to work with my team and figure out how to bring this more formally into the CPVs and more formally into, uh, I mean, there's a lot going on, that's what we've all said, but it, it is a matter of capturing the way ahead with how to get every asset we can put into into that theater security cooperation framework. So um, we'll, we'll take that on. Thank you very much. Yeah. Right here. Uh, Colonel Rich Dots, Joint Staff J5, and this is aimed at General Huggins and General Talley. Uh, there's the old saw that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And as we go into a smaller army, it's going to be more important to utilize the assets we have more effectively. And a lot of phase zero kinds of things, and we talked already, if you, if you have to go into the shape and win piece of it, to some extent you've, you've failed. But as we go through the force calculation calculus, and we're going through the QDR process and things right now, we don't look at phase zero typically to generate that demand signal. So, sir, from a G357 standpoint and from a, a, a USAR standpoint, where a lot of those skills that we use in the phase zero piece are, are we looking at modifying that process or taking into account things we could do in phase zero to help create a demand signal? Are we are working with the COCOMs to do that? Thank you very much. Yeah, before I, as I give Jim a chance to think about that one, I can hear his wheels turning. <laughs> Um, Plunking. <laughs> let me just capture the, it's really the Army Service Component Commanders that are capturing that demand signal for us. And that demand signal is on the rise. Um, all we have to look at is uh, the, the mission alignment order uh, for 14 and 15 is an upward curve. So that demand signal for the capabilities that are uh, extant within our reserve component and the active component is on the rise. And we are capturing that through our Army Service Component Commanders uh, because, frankly, um, we're doing a lot out there that, as you uh, capture, is, is not necessarily being codified. And, and we're, we're codifying that through our Army Service Component Commanders. But to you, Jim. Thanks, sir. <laughs> um, I, I, he's not a plant, so he, but I, I would give Colonel Dodd some credit for probably knowing a little more than, uh, than his question indicated about what's going on. Um, and it is, it is in, in essence, a very, very difficult question. This, this last year in the uh, global force management process, um, PACOM actually did a very, very good job at capturing the demand um, 
required to do their phase zero operations. And it really helped the Army. Um, uh, while it is not, for, not a force sizing construct, I mean, it, it, it helped make the argument that capacity matters. And sometimes capacity matters. Um, but I will tell you that in, in an effort, I'm very pleased to see that we're developing right now, working with the Joint Staff, um, is, is we're talking about a concept that really goes through, you know, what would be the steady state requirement? Now, you know, if there was a crisis and you had to go fight a, a major war, but what is the steady state requirement either before that and then post that? Uh, you know, our general math that we use in the Army is about for, and I'll just go to BCT since it's an easier analogy, 12 BCTs is about a steady state requirement for us. And, and I won't go through the whole list, but that's a few in Afghanistan, that's one in uh, Kuwait with James Terry, and, and one in the peninsula on Korea, and whatever, the number is 12. And that's steady state day to day. Um, if there was a, uh, some sort of an outbreak and we had to respond to a major theater of war, um, so now what would the steady state be? Um, and, and what we're trying to do is get that captured in the demand signal as we look at structure bills and enforce sizing constructs in the future. I mean, we, we've gone through some scenarios that we would say, hey, well, it depends on how bad we have to, you know, the situation is that we have to re respond to. Um, but one that we think, because informed by the new normal, we, we believe we probably should still keep, even if there is a contingency that breaks up, arises, we should keep eight in a steady state. Um, and that would be things like, well, we'd probably commit the GRF first, but we'd have to reconstitute the GRF. It's an Army thing, so we kind of do that. And then the next one would be, you know, we, we probably don't want to take, especially if maybe the crisis is in the, in the Pacific, we don't want to, we don't want to take the brigade that's sitting with James Terry and move it. So I probably need to keep that in a steady state. I don't think Pat Donahue would be real happy if I came down and took 2-1-ID out because they, they, they haven't got a lot of allocated forces. They certainly have no assigned forces. And he's getting a lot of bang for the buck, so I've got to leave that there. Um, I, I will tell you that we, we'd have to make some hard choices for PACOM and some hard choices for Southcom in the future because you know, we're just now moving out with our National Guard partners in terms of trying to work the 48th uh, Brigade out of Georgia, uh, working regional aligned forces for Southcom. So that theater deterrence force, which would be sort of a floor, we'd have to add that into whatever we need in terms of the other crisis. And a large percentage of that floor are the forces that Jeff Talley has. And I, I, won't, I won't go there in that regard because th those are the enablers that, that we committed to build along with uh, six brigades for a contingency force pool that we're trying to build in 14 to, to hedge a little more strategic risk for the chief and the nation. But I'm hoping in the construct, without a demand signal, that we get some help with this steady state theater deterrence force that has to exist regardless of whichever way we shift. I mean, this, this idea of a swing force, I'm not, I'm not so sure that's going to work. Well, thanks for the question. I've, I'm fortunate that General Allen and General Huggins have pretty much answered it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I'll say a couple of uh, simplistic or simple things. First off, as, as I go around as the car and talk to combatant commanders and their DCOs and their teams, first thing I do is reinforce that the Army Senior Service Command is the one-stop shop to the Army Active Guard Reserve. And that a lot of folks forget a really fundamental concept. General Allen provides, he's the force provider for all conventional forces in the Army Active Guard Reserve. That's those two simple things I just said, it's, a, it's shocking to me how many people don't know that, even within the Army. So when we go back to that concept of those Army Reserve engagement cells embedded into the ASCCs and my ARETs that are already embedded, but we're trying to reorganize them at the COCOMs, the reason they're there is to help the COCOMs send us, a, a help, help them send an educated signal on what enablers they need for phase zero and to make sure all of that request gets down eventually through the right channels, you know, through ForceCom to USARC. The second point that I would make is those cells or teams, which are all full on active duty with a one star on active duty in charge of them, to include our AREX and then our ARETs, 
They're linked, as I mentioned, to all of the theater enabling commands that represent that capability for the Army. We're going we're to have a mirror image of all those AREX and ARETs that are not on active duty, that are TPU soldiers. And I, and I have the benefit of being a commander and a component leader. The Army Reserve is the only component that's also a single command. So what does that mean to you? That means I don't need to go through the Pentagon to direct order people on active duty with no notice if they're aligned to, say, U.S. Army Pacific. For example, I already have about 5,000 troops in U.S. Army Pacific full time. But let's say I've got that AREC cell there and something comes up where we need to surge the phase zero planning capability that gets to those enablers in the Army. I, it just takes one quick decision by me, of course I would talk to my boss, General Allen, and boom, you just got 50 more Joes that are there the next day to help you with that critical planning. By the way, we did this all prior to OIF-1. We used to have, it was a little more ad hoc relationship, but I'll, I'll be a little parochial, let's talk about the great engineer regiment we have in our Army. The INCOMs, which are both in the Army Reserve, now called Theater and Avon Commands, they had positioned forward in Third Army a big planning cell. I was part of that planning cell. And then I was a professor at Notre Dame. I got a call on Tuesday night, it was, it was during final exams, that hey, you got to leave Thursday to get on a plane with your A bag and B bag and you're going to Kuwait to do immediately emergency planning for early entry into the theater from an engineering perspective, A pod and E pods, and you're part of that deployable command post theater engineer command. There's no MOB site, there's no nothing. Get on the plane and go. Luckily, I gave the final exam, graded the papers when I got over to Kuwait, <laughs> and executed the mission that I was assigned. Now, ended up staying there for a while, as you might guess, because OIF, OE, o, o, OEF, and then it was called OEF, kicked off. But that's, that's what we did then, and it worked great. And now we're just trying to formalize that through all of our ASCCs and COCOMs. But I want people, I want to keep beating the message. The Army Reserve exists to, for one reason, to serve COMPO-1 and to make sure, through General Allen, that we're linked and understanding and helping to find that signal, demand signal, from those CGs, the ASCCs, and direct support of those total force as a line through COCOMs. But it's a great question. Thank you, sirs. Right back here, please. Hi, uh, Sam Himmel, Institute for Defense Analyses. Um, this is another question that sort of comes off of the, the phase zero concept you've been describing. And earlier you mentioned how important it will be in a lot of the AORs to keep things at phase zero. So w is the sort of regionally aligned force construct that you've been talking about this morning, to what extent does it merit or require a second look at how uh, irregular warfare capabilities are kept resident in the general purpose forces? And uh, not just for soft support interfacing, but, but for missions they conduct it themselves. Well, I'll, uh, I'll start it, and I'm sure that several teammates will pile on here, but I, I think up front we talked about uh, the ability to provide the full range of military operations uh, capability uh, from within our organic formations to do regional line force uh, uh, capabilities. And, uh, I mean, that includes the ability to do advise and assist, that ability to assist a unit if they're dealing with an insurgency. Uh, clearly, we have a lot of expertise within our Army. Um, but uh, I, I think um, as we currently look at it, we don't assess that we need to expand the extant capability that we have because we have such broad expertise across the conventional force. And I'll open it up to other panel members that want to pile on. Yeah, you know I'm I, looking at you, Chris. Yes, sir. <laughs> so I, I, I believe, you know, our Special Warfare Center and school will maintain the lead on irregular warfare for, for the Army in, in the future, but certainly the RAF concept and the increasing frequency of RAF elements deployment into the theaters provides us a great opportunity for improved soft and conventional force interdependence, not only back at home station CONUS, but more importantly, forward in theater in support of the combat commander. And so I think we'll, we will be able to work a lot of these irregular warfare issues, not only in the schoolhouse, but then forward in, in specific countries. Um, I think, you know, look, the Army is going to have a challenge here. And, the, and essentially, 
I hate to return to kind of what's the horse I've been flogging the whole time here, but I mean, I mean, look, DOD's essentially re-traditionalized defense strategy, right? They basically said, look, um, we're going to manage the terrorist problem remotely and with special forces, and uh, the rest of your problem essentially is going to be either a rising recalcitrant Iran or China, right? And so if it doesn't essentially fall into those two bins, uh, it's going to be low on the low on the pecking order. Um, and, and, and all the great efforts on the part of the Army, the Marine Corps, and I think SOF actually will continue to, um, to be able to sort of, um, you know, benefit from the IW challenge more so, I think, than the conventional forces will because, frankly, um, in the effort to sort of constrain the investment of resources, uh, the IW challenge at its worst is a manpower intensive challenge that uh, essentially DOD is trying to divest from um, in the mainstream, right? Um, and that if they have to actually do it, they say we're going to do it with slack, we're, the slack we have in the reserve component, et cetera. Um, so I just think actually this is going to be a challenge, actually. What I think will be the most dominant problem for DOD for the next 20 years will also be its, it, bureaucratically what it sees as least important. right here. Greg Wilcox from SRI International. <clears throat> it occurs to me that one of the problems that we have currently, and we're going to have with RAF, and that we've had with our allies for some ISR capabilities that gain the information and the troops on the ground who need it immediately which could be treated as current information. Is there any effort or attempt to look at this <clears throat> formation of RAF as an opportunity to not challenge, but reconcile Title 10 and Title 50 law? Like a three, five, title 10, that's uh, 357. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking for the two for the Title 50 side. I can't find her. So, um, so a great question. Uh, I, I would say that, um, first off, I'm, I'm not 100% with you that I think we've made some tremendous increases in terms of our capability to share information. Tremendous. Both Chris and I, General Allen was on one flank. He was all, Chris was all over us in, in the last year. Um, and, you know, we're in there with a pretty strong coalition in terms of trying to, trying to work that. Do we need to get better? Fully acknowledge. You know, there, there is always this disclosure piece we've got to watch. Um, access to real-time intel, I, you know, I, again, we always want to get better, but I'm going to tell you, I, I, don't, I don't know how much better it could get. Uh, there's always a timely issue, but, it, you know, it, it takes time to even process orders, not just intelligence. So I, I'm not as down on it on that, but is RAF an opportunity um, to help that? Absolutely it is. Um, I can't tell you the number of discussions I've, I've been in and had with uh, the twos of the world and, and, and General Legere. It is, it is generally the guys like us in previous lives who just say, I want it, I want it now, and just do it. Um, and then it doesn't happen for us instantaneously because we didn't ask in a timely manner, and we but we come out and we, you know, criticize the system. I I, I think it's gotten much more responsive. Do we can always strive to get better? Um, I, obviously, it's intuitive that you say with RAF, the more exposure we have with our partners, you know, the more opportunity we have to build relationships to work through those um, challenges that could exist rather than throwing a coalition together at the last minute. So I I got to admit that that works. But I also would not stand up on a bandwagon and say that we're, we're absolutely broke. I mean, you know, the things we put together, not just Afghanistan, but with some of the crisis response elements that we had to do in the recent uh, past, I think we've leveraged other cap countries' capabilities. Could we uh, do better? Yes. Has there been some oversights? Possibly yes also. Um, but we're pulling an, an awful lot of information, and you can argue intelligence in that, um, through data systems that have to go through commanders and then has to get processed into decisions. Um, I'm just not 100% there that 
that we're 100 percent broke. I, I, I do. I will admit we've got to get better. But I don't know if Chris has got any better examples for the other panel members. But I, I, I firmly believe that RAF can help us. Um, but if if commanders ask for the uh, for the foreign disclosure approval the day before you cross the LD, you, you might have a problem. And then it's left to the commander to mitigate that risk, which I know what General Allen and I would do, but yeah, we, we're. Yeah, and, and I would tell you, uh, just for everybody in the audience, uh, we all work with uh, uh, allies and partners in the current fight, and uh, we have never prevented relevant intelligence from being provided to our partners to ensure they can protect their force and accomplish their mission. So don't anybody walk away from here thinking that that would ever happen. It will never happen. All right, sir, we have a question online, and then I'll go to you, sir. Uh, the online question has to do with defense support to civilian authorities. And specifically, the question is, what about regional alignment of forces, and how does it apply to DISC emissions? Let me let me try a little bit. Uh, we'll see if uh, see where this goes. The uh, one of the things we do have quite a bit of expertise in in the uh, National Guard is that defense support to civil authorities. Now, you, depending on what side of the fence you fall down, you're going to call it National Guard support to civil authorities. You're going to call it defense support to civil authorities. You have to get past that argument to begin with, but. Uh, the opportunity to work with partner nations on that, those types of issues that, that bring a uh, systematic approach to dealing with an emergency, a crisis in some way, we have a great deal of experience with that. And so as it escalates within uh, a country or uh, the opportunity to apply more resources to that, we can lend that and have lent that to a number of, uh, of nations. Uh, Israel is probably one of the, the best examples of a civilian force that incorporates a, uh, uh, a part-time military with a full-time military and, uh, and it escalates fairly quickly in the response and the integration and that kind of thing. In working with uh, our partner with New York and South Africa, we have gone in and tried to use those parts and pieces that, uh, that have occurred to us at the state level and those that have managed those uh, to, to lend expertise in that area. Uh, the World Cup, uh, for example, a number of years ago, we worked with South Africa in, uh, in bringing some of the law enforcement that we have relationships with uh, to, to the table and communicated uh, how we do things in New York, for example, through NYPD, up through the state, and then where we would need to go with our defense coordinating officer into a Title X capability and that whole range. And so, again, I think as uh, General Donahue would look at, uh, at his countries in Africa, for example, since he's sitting at the table, uh, he has all of those, those uh, experiences laid out regardless of the component, and we can bring that in a... Uh, to, the, to our partners uh, in this case. If I think I understand the question right, I guess the, the way I would answer it is, this looks to me as this is the responsibility of a guy named General Jacoby, the combatant commander of NORTHCOM, because that's how I interpreted the question. And so who is his one-stop shop for anything Army, Active Guard or Reserve? It's called Army North and the CG of Army North. And so the Army Reserve Engagement Cell is all, there's also one embedded in Army North, where we also have a DCG, a Deputy Commanding General for Reserve Affairs, embedded right in there. And then I have an Army Reserve Engagement Team at NORTHCOM. And those are aligned with special units and capabilities across the United States to provide Army North and General Jacoby with Title X immediate response forces that would be dealt with, say, for a complex catastrophe in the event that they would require that. This also can be taken advantage of under the uh, recent National Defense Act of 2012, particularly 12304 Alpha. In fact, the Army Reserve executed this uh, where we had pump units respond in less than 24 hours notice over to New York and New Jersey to, to do dewatering operations at the request of the combatant commander. All of the emergency prepared liaison officers for the entire Department of Defense are actually provided by the, to the DOD by the Army Reserve. 
and they're aligned under one of our commands called the 76th ORC, or Operational Readiness Command, commanded by Dan York. And so we see NORTHCOM and our support to NORTHCOM no different than any combatant command. We provide that direct linkage to, through the AREX and the ARETs back down to our formations. By the way, those teams report back to USARC, which reports just to General Allen. That way we don't have a separate stovepipe of activity. And what we find is it's, it's worked very well. We also have uh, the discommission for uh, DSERF for certain responsibilities to NORTHCOM. And so right now, we look at strengthening that relationship. And of course, we, we do this in support of the ASCC and the COCOM uh, in partnership with our National Guard brothers and sisters who would do you know, the heavy lifting within the states. So uh, that's how I would answer that question. Uh, hopefully, that gets to the uh, sort of answer you're looking for. Thanks. All right, sir, we have time for one more question, sir, to you. Uh, Colonel Jeff Hartman, uh, I'm at the uh, Chiefs uh, Strategic Studies Group. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. I, I, have two, I have two related questions. The, the first is for General Chamon. Uh, General Chamon, can you discuss France's multilateral and bilateral efforts and, and where you think the French Armed Forces receive the most benefit, whether in Africa or elsewhere? And for the American panelists, are, are there any specific uh, plans or efforts right now to build partnership capacity on the, on the conventional side in any specific partners as, as part of RAF. Thank you. So it's a very interesting question because we have a, a big involvement in multilateral organizations. Uh, we have been in Afghanistan, so we are focusing in interoperability in a, a NATO force. And this is one of my missions for doctrine to have a very good interoperability. We have also big, uh, big bilateral um, issues uh, with our allies. I mentioned the expeditionary force we are preparing with the, with the Brits. We have also some bilateral uh, projects, for example, with the Italians for the Brigade Mountains, with the German, we have uh, the German-French Brigade. So this is bilateral efforts with our allies. Uh, with the African countries, uh, we have an old tradition of military cooperation. I mentioned the agreements we have. So the agreements are not only for uh, an emergency response if there is a main crisis, it's also for prevention. And we have uh, permanent officers and troops that prepare the African units. Um, I didn't mention the, the project we have with our American counterpart. We have a yearly training and doctrine conference with the TRADOC. And next is in November, and we will exchange about how we can share with the American or African experience or training or some issues like that. So I think uh, it's uh, open. Thanks, Oliver. And uh, if I uh, heard your question right about do we have specific plans within regionally aligned forces to, ve to develop partner capacity in, in any part of the, to the globe, um, we as an army do not. Uh, we, regional aligned forces are specifically in response to the needs identified and the requirements identified by the geographic combatant commanders through our Army Service Component Commanders. So as they identify the needs, we will prepare and tailor the force to meet that mission. And uh, we, we are not generating missions uh, uh, from the Army uh, standpoint. All right, sir, to you for any closing remarks. Hey, listen, uh, I appreciate the dialogue, and uh, as I uh, uh, assured Steve, the threat of any more PowerPoint slides was sure to in ensure that we had the, the right mix of uh, questions, but uh, in all seriousness, uh, we appreciate the questions that, that you've raised. If you have additional questions, uh, Jim Huggins is, is going to be standing by um, <laughs> to answer them. Just kidding. Uh, it, it's been great dialogue, and uh, I, I appreciate the participation from all of the expertise that we have here uh, that's uh, represented. And uh, if you would please join me in a round of applause for the, uh, the work of our team. Thank and I'd like to, uh, before I uh, close this out, also uh, give a uh, shout out to the Association of the United States Army for pulling this panel together and for supporting us in this critical dialogue as part of the uh, Institute for uh, Land Warfare. And uh, 
we, uh, we all uh, wish you the best as you continue on here in uh, AUSA. God bless you and your efforts and your support uh, to our mission and to our soldiers, and particularly for those uh, soldiers deployed overseas and their families back home. God bless you. Thanks. Okay. Good to see you again. I know.